All right, we got to keep it going. I'm going to introduce our next speaker, which is a very good friend of mine. We've uh, performed together all over the country. Uh, Victor Harris is a poet, college graduate, a businessman, and a very good friend of mine. So we're going to bring him on the stage right now. Victor Harris. Hey, how you guys doing? Let's go with this one. All right. Um, in support of today's theme, Discover Reason. This poem is entitled, Falcor is my homeboy. I believe in dragons. Not the metaphorical kind, but the metaphysical kind. The mystical kind that flies through skies and raids villages and lets virgins are sacrificed. The magical kind that breathes fire and does battle with wizened wizards wearing pointy hats and holding staffs. See, I believe in dragons because I can see evidence of their descendants scattered around the earth. You call them dinosaurs, but I know the truth. They are dragons who never lived long enough to learn how to fly, but my dragon survived so that he could try to pass the truth on to me and I, as his righteous prophet, am here to pass the truth on to you. My dragon is the son of his father. Before there was anything, there was nothing but the father of my dragon. He coughed up a hairball and caught the sun aflame. A few millennia later, he had seven bowel movements to form the planets, but he had plans for the earth. So he was careful in what he ingested, making sure that it was right for life. And now, in order to protect us, his most precious creation, he carries us through the universe in his claws. My dragon will one day poop planets, but for now he evacuates asteroids into the atmosphere. Scientists have been fooled into thinking they come from space, but I know the truth. And now so do you. My dragon did damage when he was younger demanding sacrifices from believers in death to non-believers, but now he is a kinder, gentler deity. He lives in the hills behind my house and he protects me as his righteous prophet. And I give him thanks and praise when he uses his magic to make things go my way. And I plead for forgiveness when his angry footfalls causes the earth to quake. Science attempted to, scientists attempted to tell me that he doesn't exist because he has no influence in his environment. They say that there is no fecal matter congruent with the large lizard evident in the immediate vicinity, that there is not enough food that exists in the ecology to feed one as large as he, but my dragon defies science. My dragon lives outside the scope of science. My dragon is magic. Physicists attempt to tell me that a dragon large enough to make the earthquake would need to be visible from space, and I reply with magic. Ornithologists try to tell me that its wings would need to be immense in order to lift one so large, and I reply with magic. They try to tell me that fire could not physically exist in a lizard, that flammable expectorant is not enough to cause dragon breath, but an ignition system is needed as well, and I reply with magic. Friends and family plead with me to get help. They say that the way that I go on about dragons, I must be crazy, and I can see that some of you agree with that assessment. But consider that every inhabited continent has legends about dragons. Consider that every human culture tells tales about these great beasts. If you would only consider that there have been millions of books written about these winged worms, if you only had faith the size of a mustard seed in the existence of my dragon, you would see that the evidence is irrefutable. Well, it was irrefutable until I reached middle school when I had my first science class and learned the scientific method. You postulate a hypothesis, arrange a test to check the validity of your hypothesis, and if it isn't valid, you must come up with a new hypothesis. But if it holds true, you need to submit your findings and experiment for peer review. Science tells us how the natural world works, and my dragon was admittedly untestable. Despite the mountains and mythologies, they had no foundation in reality. My dragon's existence became questionable. When I hit high school, I learned about biology, the way the human embryo progresses from single-celled organism to fully-fledged human being. 
My irrefutable evidence got a little shaky because there was no need for me to be descended from a Treyu and the Impress. Then I got to college and learned about potassium argon dating. The way an object's age can be determined by how much potassium argon remains in its structure and did some of my own research. I read the evidence and formula for the Big Bang and by then my dragon had all but disappeared. Replaced by reason, I am more amazed now by my minuscule place in the universe, my own existence and its improbability. To quote Richard Dawkins, we are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they are never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will in fact never see the light of day outnumber the sand grains of Arabia, certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively exceeds the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I and our ordinariness that are here. This is the way my belief in dragons dissipated into skepticism as maturity took me. There is a quote I read in a collection of mythologies that has stayed with me through the years. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, and reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. And yet, Christians continuously attempt to convince me that their deity is real. Thank you.